Welcome to Healthcare Aptitude, where healthcare's thought leaders will examine ways to address the rising costs of care in America. We'll also examine how the latest advances in mobile apps are helping hospitals and health systems bend the cost curve and improve patient engagement. Welcome to Healthcare Aptitude. I'm Tom Testa, along with Bruce Kennedy. And Bruce, we're going to be mixing things up a little bit for our latest episode, as we'll be replaying an interview from the Collective Voice of Health IT. For those of you who don't know, it's a great podcast developed by our friends at Weedy, who do outstanding work on improving healthcare information exchange through the use of health IT, and they're, they're really great advocates for the industry. They recently had a familiar voice join them in Greg Jones. Yeah, Tom. Greg and his team actually joined us a few episodes ago to explore the mobile friendliness of fire integration technology. And it was a wonderful conversation with Greg and his team. For those listeners that don't remember, for new listeners, Greg Jones is the chief technology officer here at Mobile Smith Health. Greg has a really great background. I mean, everybody knows typically what a, what a CTO does at a healthcare technology company. Obviously, he is our technology leader combined with leading uh, development operations and IT security and all those wonderful things. But in this interview with Weedy, Greg goes into his background a little more in depth and really talks about how his experience working with big data on the state side, because he mm-hmm. used to work for the state of North Carolina, but right. big data on the state side and how that that translates into managing big data on the healthcare side, on the corporate side, and how that's influenced his approach to some of the products that, that we've developed here at MobileSmith. And then he takes it a step further and really begins to talk about what our applications are doing in terms of bridging the divide between big data and personalized health information, and then begins to talk a little bit more in depth about the impact of AI and machine learning right, in helping us better enable apps to both react to patients and patients' needs, but also be very reactive from an analytic standpoint to the information that healthcare providers need and desire to better provide levels of care and better create a positive patient journey that ends in, in, in improved outcomes. And so Greg did a great job talking about that entire spectrum of development, which is why we really do want to recast this interview for right. for our listeners. Yep, no, you're right. Greg is a fantastic guest and and he's been a great guest of ours and the Weedy Podcast is lucky to have had him join and we're looking forward to having him on future episodes as well here on Healthcare Aptitude. So in the meantime, everyone sit back and enjoy the special episode of Healthcare Aptitude featuring Greg Jones on the Collective Voice of Health IT Podcast. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm using my mobile phone for everything uh, lately, right? We're using it for our restaurants, what to eat. We're uh, taking vacations with our mobiles by <laughs> watching uh, videos of, of uh, national parks. And uh, we're starting to use more and more our mobiles to think about our health and uh, to get us around hospitals and to book telehealth visits. Uh, so this is why it's a great time to talk to Greg about uh, Mobile Smith Health and what he's working on. Greg, uh, very happy to have you on our show. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Good. And I'd like to dive right in and ask you a bit about your own personal journey, how how you got into healthcare and maybe how you got into the the mobile app part of healthcare. Sometime point in your past, I think you worked in a a Navy submarine. Do I have that right? Yes, that's right. So that's that's where I really started my adulthood was in was in nuclear submarines. And at that time in the late eighties, there was really only a few computers on board. And I jumped to the opportunity to manage the programs that were running on it. Well, I talked to my officers on board, and I, and I said, what do you think I should do next? And they said, go to engineering school. Get out of the Navy, go to the engineering school. And I took their advice, and I went to electrical engineering school. And I realized I had a knack for computers compared to electronics. So I started my career in engineering, but I ended up in the careers of IT, and I really enjoyed the business from the business analysis side all the way through to creating solutions and developing solutions as a programmer. And so I did that. I ended up being CTO at the state of North Carolina's Department of Public Safety, which also included law enforcement and emergency management. What I was trying to do throughout my whole career was improve technology and basically improve business through automation. So the state government is a very complicated and a great challenge to try to improve using technology to improve 
process for the standard citizens of North Carolina for me. And I did that. And we had a lot of successful programs that really accelerated technology and software development processes. And when I had the opportunity to come to MobileSmith at the time, it was really about taking mobile to the next evolution of technology. Where isn't mobile at today? A lot of things I do is based on mission versus just technology. So the mission was very attractive and the technology was obviously there. It's a great challenge as well. So all those little pieces kind of made for the recipe that brought me here today. I, I love the fact that you started as a, as a, you know, the joke about a nuclear physicist. You might not have been a nuclear physicist, but you were uh, working on a, a nuclear submarine. And from your experience at the state level, and it, it sounds like you were involved with uh, public safety, right, and police, is there issues that you learned thinking through technology at the state level and about police that you brought over to think about healthcare? Or is healthcare a whole different animal and you just can't apply the same things you learn about a different industry or a different sector to healthcare? The fact that it is that there's a lot of connection with federal government and, and private sector, the, the joining of those two worlds was very easy for me to understand. And where it might really deflate a lot of people to see that there is no way getting out of getting to tomorrow to where we really want an idea to excel. That is what public safety is all about, is for public safety, we have to stay ahead of the bad guy. So technology is a very easy way to do that. But how do you make sure that it's safe, that it actually provides and supports the mission? Because the first thing about public safety is safety of life. So it's not getting the bad guy and putting him in jail. And that's one thing that I was really glad to, to know when I went to public safety was it's about first responders. It's about safety of life. So in healthcare, it's also about that. And so now it's coming to, well, where is technology today when it comes to making a patient more healthy? And with that health question, well, what does that mean? That's the challenges that we're dealing with when it comes to remote patient management and mobile apps and how much of that information really needs to be tied to a provider's EMR and the information that the provider is getting as well. And right now, it kind of reminds me back to the days where I was in GIS data with the Department of Transportation. I also did some time with the Department of Transportation. And we had different ways of doing surveys. There were survey grade GIS devices, and then there were recreational grade devices. You wouldn't create a map using a recreational device. And that basically is if I stand on a point, I could be 10 feet off from that point. So if I was to draw a road based on that level of technology, the road would be very, very hard to drive on and very, very hard to maintain. But what we could do is with that, we could accept the level of error that it was. And I could draft a path of what survey level monitoring could be done. And it's kind of the same with healthcare. I'm not asking or thinking that me as a patient should be able to put my data and my recreational devices and my recreational health tools into an EMR, because that would be kind of polluting that world. But there should be a way that that data just isn't throwaway, that there is some value to it, and that with the proper ability to share that data and not have it part of the EMR, then there might be some value into that. And that's kind of what started our whole journey in providing patient pathway-based and remote monitoring-based healthcare is to take that data and bring it into the EMR as a attached, uh, launchable client in the EMR. So the data is separated from the EMR, but it's still associated with the EMR if the provider or a nurse wants to see it. So at the end of the day, that's a very sim simplistic perspective of how that data can be shared from a patient all the way into an EMR. Gotcha. So I heard, I heard two interesting things there. First, you are coming from government, uh, both the Department of Transportation and, and your, um, your state work, which is interesting because there's so much data in government. And certainly if we're going to conquer this healthcare data and consumer-driven healthcare and everything we're talking about, then there has to be that marriage of government and corporate. And, and you move from the government to corporate, I think, with that view. The second thing you started to talk about uh, was things that are not uh, necessarily don't belong, data that doesn't belong in the EMR. 
Talk to us a little bit more about that. Maybe give us an example of what kind of data you're talking about that might help a nurse or help the holistic healthcare goal there, which doesn't belong in the EMR. Yeah. So one of our products that we have is a product called Periop, and it's designed to take the documentation that a patient is handed in preparation for a surgery or for a post-procedure recovery process and take that documentation and replace it with with specific tasks and measurements and what we call health trackers in a mobile app. So in preparation for a, a surgery, the tasks that are need to be done, they can be done with the proper amount of time before the surgery. What that allows for is if a patient does not provide or states that they've completed those tasks, that gives the nurses the capability to notify that patient, hey, have you done this task? It's showing in our system that you're not. So our system provides a dashboard in their EMR with a list of all the pathway, we call them pathways. They're patient pathways though, with a patient pathway in which the nurses to see which patients that are up for surgery soon are in violation of certain tasks. What that can do is that could prevent the patient from still being able to have that surgery at that time. They will have to reschedule that surgery. And having that information much sooner would allow the reduction of unused surgical OR environments where a patient shows up, hey, did you eat anything today? Because you're not supposed to. Well, all I had was a piece of toast this morning. Well, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to reschedule your appointment. So that's a lot of cost to the provider and the patient, had they known a lot sooner, had they had a, a better tools and better communication that really didn't impact the hospital, that chance for that surgery could have happened in a much better way, number one. Number two, if the surgery went well and now they're having to do post-operative care, well, is there a way to track and help them track that they are getting better? So if they have to do exercises, say they have some procedure done that requires them to do exercises, are those exercises being tracked? If you have to drink a certain amount of water, are we helping to make sure that you're drinking that water, medications, all those things? And that's just one procedure for one patient. And if you multiply that by the 10,000 procedures that happen in a large hospital per year, and you multiply that by the amount of cost that could happen from Medicare or Medicaid if recovery is not performed correctly, HCAP scores being impacted, all of those things by simply just providing a mobile app that can help that patient stay responsible. I think most people want to be responsible. I know when I get up in the mornings that my phone is one of the few things that I pick up in the morning. Cup of coffee, obviously, is another one. So the, if I have a procedure coming up, you know, it's just nice to have an app to say, hey, here's what you have to do today, or here's what you have to do this week, or nicely, hey, congratulations, there's nothing you got to do this week because you did it all, or there's nothing yet to do. It's a very stressful time for a patient, and so this app provides a lot of that capability. Then we talk about how one in three people in the United States have a chronic disease issue, and so we have a chronic care solution as well that helps to have that ongoing health tracking and monitoring going remotely. And with that, then we're giving health responsibility back to the patient themselves and giving them the tools so that they can see that they're being responsible. I know with healthcare, it can kind of be a hit or miss of what all this data means. So having that capability in the palm of a patient's hand, allowing that patient to be more and more responsible is a good way of ensuring long-term health for a patient, wellness of that patient. On top of all that, now we're talking about remote health and that patient might need some help. So that's where we have your caregivers. So having remote care management on top of that data is another capability. And we're not even talking about EMRs. We're basically just talking about kind of what all of the new policies are that came out this year is how do we make sure that patient data is available to the patient to maximize the health of the patient? So that's what I'm basically talking about. We have already been on that bandwagon, hoping that the policies that have just been passed would allow us to even be more flexible. So it seems like we're in the right direction. 
that the government and the private sectors are agreeing to, which was great to hear. And so we're just continuing on the journey of trying to help each patient be more responsible and allow them to be more healthy every single day. Right. You're absolutely on a wave, right? Because that is absolutely where all the government legislation is. The Transparency Act, the Interoperability Act, even the No Surprises Act, all of those are saying, get the data to the consumer, get the data to the patient. You know, when you give your example, I think about, you know, anytime I've gone in for a procedure, they just hand you a big pile of papers, right? And they say, make sure you read page 10 and you do this the night before, right? (laughs) The idea of going through those papers. So it's definitely, definitely good for the patient. You've talked about the efficiencies for the hospital and how time can be saved. And then it also sounds like, you know, you're saving lives too, because if I wasn't supposed to have that five course meal before I went in for my uh, operation, then things might go badly on the, on the table, right? Right. So it has to be valuable for the provider as well. And to your point though, I was, I was on a call yesterday with a cloud vendor and it was one of those 30 minute calls. So so I had somebody talking to me and she was nice enough to go look at our website. And she's like, boy, I just had a procedure. I really wish I had this when I went through that procedure. And I said, let me guess, did they give you a whole bunch of paperwork? And she's like, yeah, they did. And And it would have been nice just to have a nice clear list of things I had to do and when I had to do them. But the other side of it, is, okay, now the patient is getting more information, is getting all the information in the palm of their hand. They are responsible. Can I tie that with all of my IoT devices that I'm working with? If I have to do steps, does steps matter? Well, for a lot of patients, just having that data and knowing that that data is tracked is excellent motivation for the patient to maintain, basically to keep their word, right? Right. If I know that I have an app that's tracking me, I tend to get up and get going, not because of any reason, just I want to keep that trend going. And I know it's good for me. And I know that's what I'm supposed to be doing if I'm recovering from a procedure that's asking me to do such activities. But the other side of it is that we have to make sure that it's a value to the provider as well. So put the data into the EMR, but keep it separate from the EMR is a goal of ours. So the beauty of most EMRs nowadays is it allows third parties to integrate their solutions in, into the EMRs. So the data is separated from the EMR data. It's available per patient. And with the new rules where a patient might request all this information, we need to be able to make sure that that data can be accessed easily and produced for the provider when they're wanting to or having to send it back to the patient. Being able to answer like questionnaires, that's another thing that we have in our, our solution. So is there a better way of handling forms that are basically more remote? And with the pandemic, it's woken everybody up to the fact that healthcare can be remote. And now the tools are there. They have been expedited in delivery of those tools simply because of the pandemic. But can I do everything remotely without having to fill out a form and hand it to somebody. And so that really is a big catalyst in our technology moving forward. You're listening to Healthcare Aptitude on Healthcare Now Radio. Our latest episode features an interview with Greg Jones from the Weedy podcast, The Collective Voice of Health IT. So, Greg, you know, we just came off a pandemic. We're all using our mobile phones. Where do you think healthcare is going to be in three, five, ten years? What's your ideal picture there? So in three years... I think already this year, AI is, has, a, has a big step forward in, a, in that. But to make AI even better, we need to have the health information exchanges that can utilize anonymized data better to have more intelligent AI. And so that's the number one advantage, I think, moving forward. But that's still, still magic to most patients. So, but that is the big thing. So, so tell me about that. What's the, how do you define AI? And maybe give us an example of how AI will be utilized. Uh, so I can give you an example of how it, let's just look at another industry. Like I used to work for a pharmaceutical company as well. And we were doing DNA, single nucleotide polymorphism identifications or SNPs. And so those SNPs helped us understand if somebody had that rare protein in their DNA that they could have a disease that nobody else would have. Systems like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, those things that came out were able to take those DNA identifiers and kind of see what the outliers were 
to help an individual potentially look for things prior to chronic symptoms appearing. And that was, I would say, 10 years ago that that technology was, was happening. So now with AI and population health, uh, machine learning is identifying based on this behavior, based on this data, it looks like people that have had similar data have also, and they have, with historical data, they're able to follow what the outcomes were for certain people. With a large enough data set, they can come to a very reliable, predictable summation of what additional patients have that may not have completed the entire journey, may have just started the journey. And so down the road, it could be more tests, more awareness of exactly what somebody needs to look at. And I kind of fit into the belief that I am no different than anyone else. So when it comes to health, when it comes to uniqueness, there's a certain thing that's going to happen. I think right now, actually, there's a company that's doing a sound-based COVID-19 test based on what your voice sounds like. Hmm. And so it's just amazing. It's like, yes, let's keep going with that. Let's not trust that it's 100% effective without a large population. But if I, as a patient, could reliably know if I feed into the system my information and that information can then be put against a large population for AI analysis, and I can come back with probabilities that I have certain situations, I might go to the doctors more often. I might say, hey, I need, can we get more blood work because I'm concerned about this or that? It's, it's basically more information, and it's taking away the idea that my doctor owns my medical record. I have no idea what my medical record looks like. I hope the next time I meet with the doctor, everything's going to be fine. We're getting way far away from that to where we have real-time mobile apps that are connected to the EMRs to where now I'm even getting to a place where I have devices connected to me that might be sending IoT readings at all times to inform me, hey, especially if I have diabetes, hey, warning here, you, you might need to relax a little bit. You're doing a podcast, it's very stressful, take a deep breath, you know, things like that, that are around today. And so in the future, in the very near future, that technology is going to be demanded, I'm hoping, by the public. I'm hoping that there will be companies that will be shipping remote devices that because they need to get certain things. Instead of you coming in for a test, they just ship you the device. They just ship you what you need to mm -hmm. get the results that you need. And it's more of a healthcare ecosystem, the same way retail is today. So we never have to leave our houses, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting, right? So you're, you're describing, you know, all these regulations and provisions and, and what they've been working on for the last 15, 20 years about freeing the data, right? Free the healthcare administrative and clinical data, get that out. And you're saying, you know, not only do we want, but we also probably need machines and AI to sift through all that data and make it usable information. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, that's right. And then if I'm, a, if, if for example, the other side of it too is I have a device, it's being shipped to me. This kind of goes towards that retail versus technical versus FCC approved devices as well. If I have a device that is off and based on my trending, there is no reason why my value should be the way it is obviously go to the proper care that I need, go to the urgent care, go to the ER. This is not right. That's a no brainer. Right. But it also could say, based on all of this data, there's something very different from your data. And so I could go to an urgent care or to an ER and get something checked out way before I even knew it. And it could just be, oh, the device we sent you is a little glitchy, but now that we're here, let's take another test. I'm assuming that's going to happen. But okay. I would rather do that. I mean, I've had a couple of COVID tests just recently. They're all negative. I'm not complaining, right. especially now that I know more about my health and I know I feel better just knowing that my health is, I know what the status of my health is for real. Right. It, it, it reminds me, I think it was a sci-fi uh, movie where you get up, you take a shower, you're either wearing a wearable or your body gets scanned, right? And it says, hey, Matthew, uh, looks like you're low on iron. You better drink some more orange juice right now, right? Like it tells you exactly right. what you are. But given that, 
here we've got all this kind of biofeedback on where our body is and where things might be going off. And, and you know, we've got game theory where I'm, I'm checking my mobile, you know, once a day, not only to, you know, check my horoscope, watch the YouTube and the news, but also to see where I am on my stocks and my health, right? Is there a danger? And I've heard this with telemedicine, though it hasn't come out statistically to be true, but is there a danger of overutilization of uh, healthcare? You know, what, we've got tremendous prices and the cost of health care right now, and we're still lazy Americans when it comes to our health care. If it suddenly becomes top of our mind, is there going to be overutilization? I think at the end of the day, you can't replace a good practitioner. That will always be there. This is where I'm talking about is can we stop something before before today we normally go and get work done, before I feel a little sick or I, I have symptoms, maybe minor, and then I go get help. The ability to block or to stop symptoms even before we know that they are occurring because AI can see that trend is, to me, a way of lowering costs in the long term. It's going to save lives. It's going to help the longevity of, of human beings. I'm still going to have to go to the provider. I'm still going to take every suggestion that they have. But it's really hey, this told me I should come and talk to you and find out really what's going on. Is there something going on or not? So to me, I see this technology not really replacing a provider's need. It's really going to change when a provider is going to be talked to. And that's going to also trigger then the testing and the tools that providers are going to need to be able to detect things in a different way as well. And on top of that, the tests that we have today, I'm assuming that those aren't going to go away. They're just going to be improved. But the patient is going to be more aware and be able to ask for help sooner. And to me, that's going to lower those costs. For chronic care conditions, for example, 70% of our health care is in chronic conditions. So if a chronic condition can be reduced and maintained at a lower cost, if 70% of our $2 trillion health care is based on chronic conditions, and we can stop them or reduce their impact on a person's life, that's a huge decrease in healthcare costs. So I very much appreciate this important discussion, Greg. Do you have any closing thoughts? Really? No. I mean, we really would like any feedback. If anybody would help us make sure that we're providing the best solutions for our patients and our, and our customers, really, our mission is to save lives. That's really what it comes down to. And as a technologist, if, any, if technologists are listening, it's not about what I built today. It's, it's irrelevant of what I built today. It's all about, did what I built today make a change in someone's life? And that's really what we're caring about. So we want to make sure that we're providing at Mobile Smith Health the best products that can help patients and their lives. Well, that's all the time we have for this month's episode of Healthcare Aptitude. Be sure to join us next month as Bruce and I investigate more about the use of mobile apps in healthcare. Remember to catch the show on Healthcare Now Radio every weekday at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., and 11 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit mobilesmithhealth.com, or you can also send your questions to sales at mobilesmith.com. Thanks for listening, and be well. Thank you for listening to another episode of Healthcare Aptitude, sponsored by Mobile Smith Health. Be sure to tune in weekdays at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., and 11 p.m. Eastern Time on Healthcare Now Radio.